so I want to welcome anyone that's watching this, wherever they are around the world on video, and my prayer is that, that God will touch your hearts with the passion that he has put in my heart for people caught in the bondage of addiction. And we're going to go through a, a variety of teachings, um, so you do not need to have been an addict as a background. We're going to cover addiction. You don't have to be a counselor. We're going to cover counseling. And you really don't have to have done anything for God before other than love him. Uh, we're hoping to, to really include a bit of everything in this weekend so that you can leave equipped and move on from there. The first place we're going to start is understanding addiction. And I just want to explain all these initials and credentials and things like that, not out of bragging, but just sort of to let you know what God does. First of all, I am an ordained reverend. I graduated from seminary, and I graduated with a degree in Christian counselings and, and missions. So I have my doctorate in ministry in Christian counseling and, ministry and missions. And God has used that powerfully uh, to open up ministry for me in a, in a variety of places in the States and overseas. And when you mix the, the two together and add to it this internationally certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, which is what the initials at the bottom are, what that means is my credentials are recognized worldwide in counseling into addictions. So as a result of that, I've been in prisons in Iraq, uh, which as an American, uh, I was there just after the war. Uh, as a matter of fact, the day that I went into Iraq, Iraq, I came in from Turkey, and there were tanks from Turkey on the same road heading into Iraq. We've been around the world, and God now has us in South Africa as our home. And the neat thing with the, the mixed credentials is there are people um, who look at just my secular credentials and say, please come. And there are people who look at my ministry credentials and say, please come, because the reality is no country has an answer to addictions. The answer of all countries is to build more prisons and give longer sentences and keep the guys, the men and women, in, in prison as long as possible. Um, so that just sets the stage. Right off the bat, I want to give my definition of, of addiction. And I understand that this definition is different than definitions you may read in textbooks, you may find on, the, on websites and on the internet. But to me, this is, is the definition that God has built a lot of our ministry around. And that is addiction is engaging in impulsive or compulsive behavior, even though we know the consequences. So impulsive is that spur of the moment. You're sitting at home, you hadn't planned on doing anything that evening, the phone rings or you get an SMS and someone says, hey, there's a party on, would you like to come? Or you're driving in your car and you see temptation on the side of the road. And before you know it, you're pulling over, just impulsively. Compulsive is more like a magnetic draw. Compulsive behavior is that thing that we plan. It's that thing that we've we lay awake at night thinking about. Um, I use examples of, of couples where if, if the man is the addict, he can start a fight with his wife just so that in the argument he can slam the door as he goes out the door and he knows she's not going to wait up so that he can stay out all night and come home whatever and she won't ask any questions. Okay, Classic example of compulsive behavior. Another type of compulsive behavior is always having your stash with you, that you don't go anywhere or, or have your house ever in a situation that you have to be scrambling for whatever your high is, okay? And the, even though we know the consequences, those consequences can be jail, those consequences can be disease, they can be broken relationships, they can be loss of reputation, they can be loss of trust, Whatever it might be, part of addiction is that those consequences don't matter. Okay, The draw of the addiction is greater than that. So if we look at different types of addiction, 
I've listed a few here. Drugs, alcohol, sex or, or lust, pornography, anorexia and bulimia as, as two eating disorders, and we could include other eating disorders. You know, we could include different eating things, and my wife always gets upset if I include chocolate. <laughs> but now I mentioned it, okay? Cutting or, or self-mutilation, gambling, we could go on and on. There are people addicted to power. There are people addicted to control. There are people addicted to rage and money and material possessions, okay? There's, there's a variety of things. And if we take it back to the defi definition that I used, the reality is whatever that area of weakness is for us, that we know we're struggling to break free from the bondage of sin, the devil has us addicted to. No matter how much we fight it, no matter how many times we've had people pray for us, no matter how many times we've gotten on our knees and said, God, please take this thorn out of my side, we keep battling it. Okay? So, yes, as, as I work with churches, I, someone will ask, so do you mean just plain old sin can be addiction? addiction? Sure. If you're engaging in impulsive or compulsive behavior, even though you know the consequences, it doesn't have to fit the list up here. Okay? It can be whatever your area is. The great news for that for me is that helps you relate to people who are deep in addiction to drugs. That helps you relate to people who are in addiction to alcohol or pornography because you know your own personal battle that you've gone through in different areas of your life and, and what, how bad that fight was to break free. And then when you break free, it pops up again without any notice. And you have no clue where that came from. So tonight, we're really going to focus on drugs throughout most of this presentation. And so if you, know, if you need to think of other addictions, fine, just plug some words in. So just want to run through these, some reasons why people start anyway. And it can be that it's culturally acceptable. There are certain groups where the use of drugs is culturally acceptable. There are religious groups where the use of drugs is normal in that religious group. Okay? There are different cultures and countries where drinking is normal and expected, and little kids are, are given wine or beer, you know, at six and eight years old, and that's just normal. You know, that's expected. So there can be a lot of the starting that happens just because it's culturally acceptable. It can be socially acceptable, and that often fits age groups, right? A lot of times as I'm working with people in their late teens or their early 20s, what I hear is, but all my friends do it, you know, and if I stopped, I'd have no friends. This is what we do socially. When we get together to hang out, we always do that. Okay? So it can just be socially acceptable. And if mom and dad are talking to them, the answer they get is, well, when I'm your age, maybe I'll change. When I'm a mom or dad and have kids, maybe I'll change. But right now, this is what we do socially. It can be family acceptance. There can be just a specific family. It doesn't have to be their whole ethnic background or their nationality, but there can just be a family where it's acceptable in their family, okay? There, there are things that pop up on YouTube of, of older brothers giving little four-year-old kids marijuana to, to, to just try it, or a beer and say, here, be a man, and you see the little kid, you know, going around with a bottle of beer, or just a cigarette, okay? So there can be different things in different families. There, there are families where the parents are addicted to drugs, and the kids will say, I remember the first time mom or dad took me for cocaine, or I remember the first time mom and dad got high with me. And they'll talk about an experience when they were like 14. And that was just normal in their home. Another reason people could start would be a lack of awareness, just ignorance. They, you know, are growing up naive and sheltered, and they show up at a party, and it's being passed around. And they're told, ah, oh, one won't hurt you, it's no big deal. I just heard we're living down in the Cape now, and uh, down in Cape Town, and just heard recently of someone's 16th birthday party, 
and the parents bought cocaine for the party. Now, I have to assume some of the kids came totally innocent, like they had to be totally caught off guards when they walked in and there was a line of cocaine waiting for each kid. And parents and other kids to say, go ahead, it's no big deal. You know, just do one, give it a try, it's part of the party. Okay? We look at our media message and our role models. You know, professional athletes, comedians, actors, singers, news people. You know, those people that, that we see every day. And what do we hear about? Drugs, partying, alcohol, sex, okay? That's just a normal thing. And so if we think of our kids, growing up, the kids' role models are all at least experimenting in something with, with drugs or other addictions. It can be triggered by an event as a way to cope. And one event that, that I like to point out is a divorce or the break of a relationship. There can be someone who's never tried a drug in their life, and they can be in their 40s. They're aware of drugs, they've seen them in their family, they've seen neighbors with them, they've seen the devastation, but boom, divorce happens, or a death in the family, or losing a job, and all of a sudden their nerves are shot, and a friend might recommend, why don't you try this? You know, it'll help numb your pain, okay? It can just be for the high. There are people who try drugs the first time the way people would try bungee jumping, especially in teenage years. I'm just experimenting, you know? I'm strong enough to not get addicted, so I just want to experiment, and I just want to see what the high is all about, right? A lot of people have tried marijuana that way who had no intention of ever trying marijuana, but they were there and there were some friends and they said, yeah, let me see what this high is all about. And I hear a lot of people tell me, yeah, I tried that, but it didn't do anything for me, so I tried something else, okay? For some people, it can start with the prescription. When I was in Philadelphia for many years working with heroin addicts, there was one hospital in Philadelphia that had an entire ward in the hospital for city employees who got addicted to heroin as a result of an on-the-job injury. So what I mean by that is the workers would be guys working on the roads and the bridges and, and things like that, and they'd get injured on the job. Maybe they hurt their back or maybe they hurt a knee or something. And so they go to the hospital or they go to the doctor, and he would give them a narcotic painkiller, okay, he would give them Oxycontin, Oxycodone, or the, the popular ones in the States, so things that are opium derivatives, derivatives. And as their prescription runs out, they go back to the doctor and he refills it. Then it runs out again, they go back to the doctor and he refills it. And eventually the doctor says, you know, you really need to start weaning off these. And the doctor didn't tell him anything at the beginning about getting addicted or how addicted these prescription drugs are. And he just happens to live in Philadelphia. And I lived in Philadelphia for many years. And the section that I lived in was the worst heroin area in the United States. So he knows, oh, I can just switch to heroin. And he finds out it's cheaper than trying to buy his prescription illegally. And so they just slide into a prescription use. The oldest person I found that started heroin that way was 84 years old the first time she did drugs. 84. And it came straight to heroin from pain medicine. There was a man that I knew very well who was 62 when he tried crack cocaine for the first time. And he tried it out of the pressure of retirement at age 62 and a relationship problem with his wife. And all of a sudden, it was, well, let me try this stuff that the kids are doing, right? Anybody under 50 might have been a kid to him. And so at age 62, he started a three-year multi-state run of crack cocaine. Okay, it's easy to just say that's insanity, you know? And yes, it is, right? Addiction is insanity, okay? I talked about some of these 
experiment, experimentation, the fun of it. You're at a party. People will dare you. People will mock you if you don't try it, right? And that's why when you read some of the statistics in school, when kids are starting drugs earlier and earlier and earlier or sex earlier and earlier and earlier, it's because the kids daring them are daring them younger or younger or younger, okay? And so rather than be mocked, rather than feel like the outsider or the outcast, they go, oh, sure, I'll try it, okay? There's peer pressure in dating. Right? So it doesn't only have to be your friends, it can be the person you're dating. You know, if you're getting really serious with that person and they happen to drink or they happen to do drugs, eventually you end up trying it. And that's a big problem for people in recovery. They go back to someone who's also in recovery and try to keep each other strong. The reality is if one of them starts to slip, the other one goes with them. Okay. Another thing is boredom, and that's a huge one in recovery. I talk about in recovery three big triggers, and we could name a thousand, but the three categories I use are anger, boredom, and sex. So if there's something in, in your life that's creating anger or frustration or discouragement or, or disappointment, or if there's something in your life that's boredom, which is why retirement can kick in, right? Okay or the, when the kids move out of the house and you're empty nesters, okay? or you lost a job and you're sitting around, or you had a career and you lost your career and now you just need to get a job because you need money, or there's no challenge at work anymore. Okay? There can be a variety of reasons that, that boredom can then kick in and trigger addiction. And sex, I say as, as one, just because you know, you run into so many things. If you're looking for sex, if you're looking for romance, the place to find it is in the bar or in the dance club or in something, right? So you're exposing yourself to all those things anyway. Many people will do it to fit in, to be accepted. And one of the things that I found worldwide, when I grew up, there were kids in school who were the druggies. And everybody knew them. And it wasn't that many. Okay? And everybody knew they were the druggies. We weren't. Okay? Well, there's still that group in school that everybody knows is using. It's larger now. And the key is, if you come to that group, it doesn't matter if you're short or tall, fat or skinny, pretty or not pretty, handsome or not handsome, smart or not smart, athletic or not athletic, you fit in as long as you'll do drugs with them. They don't have the same standards or criteria to meet to fit their clique that non-using people do. And that's a tough one for, for kids as they're growing up looking to fit in. It can be rebellion, especially, and I'll sti I'm sticking on teenagers a lot, but it can be rebellion against mom and dad. Too many rules. How comes all my friends are doing this? All my friends are going there. You make me come home at 9 o'clock. All my friends are allowed to stay out till 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock on weekends. How comes we don't have TV and the other kids have TV? How comes we don't have all the channels on our TV and the other kids have, you know, 150 channels? We only get four. How comes you don't let us watch movies that are rated for 17 and older? Or when the kids are younger, how comes you don't let us watch the movies rated for 13 and older? And seeds of rebellion get in there. And we also see this bump up again with adults when one of these devastating things happen and they're blaming God for it. And as an act of rebellion against God in their anger, they say, I'm going to head this way of addiction. Okay? Poor self-image is a big one. And I, I talked about a lot of that, but anxiety, depression, fear, problems at home, problems at school, work, or with friends, and as an escape. So a variety of reasons why people would, would use drugs the first time, okay? And as we work with people using drugs, one of the things that I can say, I've worked with over 30,000 men, women, and, and teenagers around the world that have been caught in some kind of addiction. And the thing that I have found that is the same with every addict 
is that they all have some wound inside, some emotional pain, some disconnect, something that's affected their self-image, something that makes them feel they don't fit in. It can be things like rejection and isolation and loneliness and things like that. And what they find is, whatever their high is, whether it's drugs or alcohol or sex or any of the things they talked about, it's an easy escape from those emotions. It numbs the pain. It allows you to, to escape. And if you think of someone using alcohol, you can get so drunk that you don't feel anything and eventually you pass out. Okay? So it's a total escape. I mean, there's nothing, you can't numb things any better than passing out, right? Okay, so one of the key things with all of these points of, of addiction, those of us who are clean and sober say, well, why don't you just stop? Or as Christians, why don't you just pray? Or maybe if you got a good job, or maybe if you found a good wife. But the reality is, the numbing works for tonight. All those suggestions you made don't. The, the guilt and pain and shame is still there tomorrow morning. As a matter of fact, the mountain's bigger. But it is an effective escape for tonight. You can decide, I don't want to think about this anymore, and get yourself to that point. Okay? As we look at addiction, there's a downward slope, and I sort of drew the arrows with a guy having to a weight on his back. Hey, it's the best I could do with clip art. Uh, so bear with me. And we're going to talk about each of the steps. The first step is occasional use. The second one is a habit of abuse, and we call that habituation or abuse. Okay. The third one is tolerance, where our body is getting to where it tolerates what we're doing. The, third, the fourth one is dependence, and that's addiction or dependence. And then the fifth one is withdrawal. And those are the stages. And as I said, we'll go through each one of them. So if we look at the occasional or experimental use, I talked about a lot of these. I talked about people using at parties or with friends or family. I talked about people who, experimenting, just want to use enough to get a buzz. They just want to take the edge off. Okay? Or they're just doing it to impress others. You know, if I walk around holding a drink all night, people will think I'm drinking too. Right? I'll just sip it. You know, I'll never let it get half empty because someone might fill it up and I don't want them to. Right? But I'll take maybe the top third off the drink. Or if they're passing around marijuana or daca, you know, I'll go and pass it on. And go, oh, wow, that was good, yeah. Right? Anything to, to just impress others. I've had people tell me it helps me loosen up to talk to the girls. That if I know I'm going to a party, if I have a couple of beers, I can talk to the girls. If I don't have a couple of beers, I'm too shy. And then I don't know what to say. So if I have a few drinks, it loosens my tongue. And you know what? Then the girls like me more because I'm more relaxed and I'm more funny. And before long, they convince themselves they're even more handsome with a few drinks. Because instead of one girl just liking them, four or five are all around them. And they know it can't just be because they told a funny joke. And with experimentation... People can go days or weeks in between uses. You know, it, it's sort of like a weekend warrior, we call it. Some people are payday warriors, right? Some people are just opportunistic warriors, you know? There's, there are people that, when the, when the right people are out of town, they can engage in their habit. Or if they travel in business, when they travel, they'll do it. There are tons of traveling people who only watch pornography in the hotels. Right? But I believe those people plan it. It fits that compulsive thing where it's drawing them in, and that helps them in their choice of hotel because they'll choose ones that they know have the pornography on the TVs 
or have it for free on the TVs or have it in a way that it won't show up on the receipt if they have to turn the receipt in as a business expense. Okay? So there's lots of different things that people do. As it goes to the second stage, abuse or habituation, what happens, it becomes more, more often more regular. It becomes part of a person's routine. And you begin to see impairment. You begin to see changes in emotions. You begin to see changes in mental capacity. Their physical appearance begins to change. Their social aspects change. So what do I mean by this? You might see someone lose weight unexpectedly. I know one of the things I tell guys as they're getting out of prison, if you drop five or 10 pounds, if you drop five kgs, before you go back to see your parole officer the next time, he's going to ask you a question. Right? He's going to say, you're looking skinny. Right? If all of a sudden you're talking to people and you've normally been shy and reserved and now you just have so many things to tell people about, about yourself usually. Okay? In, in America, Thanksgiving is a big holiday every November and it's a big family holiday gathered around a big turkey and lots of food and you, you eat for hours and everybody gets stuffed and then you watch American football on TV. And one of the examples that I use with, with men and women who are now clean and sober, I say your challenge is to go to a Thanksgiving dinner and actually listen to your family. They'll know you're clean and sober if you're not the one telling them everything about yourself. And then after you list them, ask them questions. Say, so how is work going? You know, I knew you were sick a few weeks ago. Are you feeling better now? And these men and women come back to me and say, you know, my family was amazed. They said, I've never asked them questions about themselves for 10 years. But in their addiction, they had no clue, right? And the evidence can be the effect on others. All of a sudden, you may see a friend that you have who's on edge all the time or starts making excuses why they can't do things socially with you because they're suspecting something or aware they're aware that their spouse or one of their kids is involved in drugs or alcohol. And so they start to isolate themselves from friends and family that they don't want to find out because they're still protecting their loved one. Okay? So that this can be an, an, an example that you see, but you don't actually see it from the person that's using. Again, I mentioned the planning for use, keeping some of the drug of choice always available. One of the, the realities when I worked um, in the beginning of, what, of doing this in that worst heroin area of Philadelphia, there were guys there who had got hooked on heroin in Vietnam, came home from the war, and continued to use heroin every day for the rest of their lives. And these are guys that were using not just one or two bags of heroin, but two bundles a day as a minimum, and that's 13 bags in a bundle. So 26 bags of heroin a day, okay? And they would never fall asleep without two bags and syringes in their pockets because they didn't want to wake up and not have money and not have drugs because they were just using so much, okay? And the reality with a lot of people who are getting into habituation, they need their fix to feel normal. And so because of that, they don't want to fall asleep without it, okay? I have a friend who, who was an alcoholic, and his wife would call me at least once a week and say, well, I found vodka behind the toaster. Well, I found vodka inside the little trash can underneath the sink but on the outside of the, of the plastic bag. I found vodka in the kid's toy chest. I found vodka inside our winter snow boots. And each time after she found a bottle, the husband said, okay, that's it. I don't have any more in the house. You found them all. You know, that's good. You threw them away. And the next week she'd find another one or two. Okay. So the, this... Always having some on hand goes to extremes. Continuing with abuse. You begin to see lying. 
and deception. You begin to see people changing the subject whenever you ask them a question for a straight answer. They're dancing around the, the topic and, and they don't want to give you an answer because, they're, one, they're afraid to get caught. Two, they don't remember the lies they told you yesterday. So even to try to repeat the same lie is difficult. So it's easier to change the subject. So if you say, so what were you doing last Friday? And you say, oh, you know, we already talked about that. What did you do last Friday? Right? De just deceptive talk, just continuing to change the subject. And people in this stage may use to seek the previous high. And this is a big one. The reality of addiction, and, and I learned this very on with guys in heroin addiction, is that one bag was too many and a thousand bags is never enough. And the reality is they feel that they can never match that first high. Okay? So it'd be sort of like remembering your first kiss. And if it had all those romantic overtures and just the perfect setting and all this and that, the candlelight and the lake in the background or what have you, and that would be that special moment and you'd never be able to match that. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why people doing drugs go to harder and harder drugs or they do to go to more drugs or they do just crazier behaviors because they're trying to match that first high. As I was in, in Lancaster County before I moved to South Africa and I was in prison a couple of days a week, I worked with the men who were charged or convicted of sexual offenses as one of the groups that I worked with in addiction. And there were people who talked about riskier behavior that they would do, trying to match the first high. And one example was one guy who, who was an exhibitionist, so he would flash himself in front of women in public. And to increase his high, he wouldn't run away. He would go just like across the street so he could still be there when the police pulled up and see the police talking to his victim, knowing that he could casually walk away and that she was so horrified she wouldn't give a good description of him anyway. Right? Because her reaction would have been, oh! Right? Okay? So he would hang there and, and he'd actually, his adrenaline would be pumping knowing the police are just there and no one knows what he looks like. Okay? So, it, as again, insanity. I'm going to keep mentioning insanity or craziness in addiction. Tolerance develops, so more is needed to reach the desired effect. Okay, we talked about that, just using more and more. And a variety of emotions show up. Stress, shame, guilt and fear, paranoia or anxiety. Uh, one of the things you should see in, in South Africa with guys doing tick. Tick is, is crystal meth from the old days. Okay. And methamphetamine comes with a huge level of paranoia. And a lot of the, the people who use tick will have, mar will have paranoia for 9 to 12 months after they stop using it. And one of the examples that I use with people who use tick and used in the States with people using crystal meth, I said, I'll bet your paranoia is so bad that if you could rip the rearview mirror out of your car and stick it into your forehead, you'd do it. They all go, yep. Right? Because the paranoia is not for all the people that you see. It's for all the stuff back here. I wonder if my probation or parole officers out there, I wonder if someone will recognize me and tell my family. I wonder if. Right? And the paranoia just becomes so consuming. And keep, again, keep in mind again, a lot of these highs numb your emotions. So as the paranoia increases, it just takes you to use more. Moving on to the third step. Addiction or dependency. Here we really have a physical or psychological need for the drug. So either your body is physically reacting and you're getting different feelings. It can be pain, it can be nausea, it can be sweating, it can be you know, just a racing of your heart, a variety of feelings, or psychological need. You can, you can be 